Introduction to Generating Professional Graphics. In this video, I'm not going to get into too much of the specific MATLAB skills or Photoshop skills or anything like that. I just want to put some graphics up <clears throat> and go through what's good and what's bad and how to make things good from a high level. Following lectures, we'll talk about the specific skills to generate those graphics. What are good 1D graphics? So we're talking about line plots here. Well, let's say I want to plot a sine and a cosine function. So I go into MATLAB and I type plot sine, plot cosine, and boom, there we are. Is this a good plot? Is this something that we would copy and paste and put into a publication or in our homework or something like that? If not, why not? What is wrong with this? Well, of course, uh, yeah, there's a lot wrong here, but let's take these just a few at a time. One, in a figure window, we should only ever really incorporate entities that have something to do with what we're trying to communicate. If we're trying to communicate sine and cosine here, why on earth would we have file, edit, view, and all of these tools? If we're doing a MATLAB tutorial, those might need to be there because we're talking about them. But if we're just showing sine and cosine, this does not need to be there. The other thing is we have this ugly gray background. Now, maybe there's a purpose for that. Maybe you're pasting into a document that's already gray. But for the most part, we don't want that there. We just want the figure with sine and cosine. OK, so we fixed those problems and we now just have our sine and cosine and our figure. Is this a good figure? Is this something that you would copy and paste into a, your homework or a publication? Well, hopefully you're saying no. And there's still a lot wrong with this. Let's look at just a few. One I might point out is these lines might be too thin, particularly if we paste this into another document and then maybe shrink it down, uh, they're not really visible. The other thing I'm looking at is this white space here. Why is there white space on the right and not on the left? Now, maybe we want this if we're going to put some kind of inset in here. Uh, otherwise, this is just wasted space. This should not be here. The other thing is the scaling on the y-axis. If we're trying to resolve sines and cosines and see their contours, why are we only using this much space? We have all of this wasted white space at the top and the bottom. And we can fix that simply by scaling the y-axis more intelligently. Now, maybe perhaps there's a reason that we're doing this. Maybe we're putting an inset here. Maybe we don't want to see the full scale of the functions. If you have a specific purpose in mind, that's fine. But I think in this case, we're making very poor use of the space and we want to fix those things. Okay, so we made the lines thicker. We improved the y-axis scaling. We got rid of the white space. Is this a good plot that we would put into our homework or a publication? Well, if you're following the pattern here, the answer is going to be no, right? And there's still a whole lot wrong with this. Let's take the next few. Whenever I look at plots and I see corners and polygon kind of looking shapes, it's very rare that something physical will have a plot that leads to polygon kind of shape. So when I see that, I see that there's not enough points in these lines to resolve smooth curves. Now, maybe that does need to be digital. Maybe each one of these discrete points is an experiment in the lab that takes a week to, to generate. So filling this in with a whole bunch of lines is just not feasible. And I think that would be okay except we wouldn't want to plot it this way. We would want to put markers here to sort of imply that this is very sparse data on purpose. But if we're just plotting sine and cosine, there is not near enough points uh, along these to resolve these as smooth, smooth curves. So we need to add points. The other thing is, what's this axis? What's this axis? Nothing is labeled. Is this time? Is this space? Is it something else? I don't know. And is this amplitude or is this time? We don't know because nothing's labeled. So we still don't really know what we're looking at. Okay, so we added uh, numbers along the axes. We now are resolving our lines very well. They're thicker. 
there is no external data or anything else going on around it. Is this a good plot? Well, no. And of course, there's still a whole lot wrong with this. Let's take the next few. There's numbers here. Can you read them? Maybe you can if your monitor's big enough, but those fonts are way too small. Typically, we want fonts that are 10 to 14 sort of size. Uh, very rare to go smaller. Not as rare to go bigger, but still kind of rare. We also need to take into account we're going to take our diagram, we're going to paste it somewhere, and then probably resize it, usually shrink it down. We need to look at the font sizes and line width after the, the diagram's put in its final size. So in this case, we need those fonts bigger. The other thing with these functions, now this is not so bad, but if we have a function that's spending a lot of time railed against the top or the bottom, sometimes I like to incorporate a little space above and below the function, not too much that we're wasting space, but just a comfortable amount that we can sort of see what's going on at the top here. The other thing is, or while we added numbers and they're too small to read, we'll make those bigger. But what are these numbers? Time, space, something else. So we need labels here. Okay, here we are. We have labeled our axes. We got F of X, angle theta, comfortable amount of white space at the top of the bottom our fonts are bigger our lines are thick is this a plot that's worthy of pasting into our homework or into a publication no in fact there's still a lot wrong with this things that could be fixed let's take the next few when the label on the y-axis is small maybe this is just an x maybe it's a in this case an f of x if it's small it looks silly to be rotated. It's rotated by default because very often this will be labeled with a longer text string, in which case that is fine. But something short like this, we really ought to rotate it so that it has a proper orientation. The other thing, I'm looking at the tick marks. These are very sparse. I would like to see more tick marks, maybe a one, a two, a three, a four, a five, and a six and a 0 0.5, positive 0 0.5, maybe even 0 0.25, 0 0.5, 0 0.75. I think we need more tick marks. Okay, so here we are. Now we've added some tick marks. We have rotated our function label here, so that looks pretty good. We have a label down here. Is this finally a good plot? that we'd be proud to paste into a publication or our homework. Well, now you're probably not trusting me. And nope, it's still not good enough. There's still things we need to fix about this. Let's take the next few. And this is starting to get a little bit picky now, but if we look at the numbers along the vertical axis, this is a one and it's in line here with the 0.5. And so really this one needs to be bumped over to the left. We need a consistent number of significant digits here. Now this may seem picky, but let's say this is posted into a presentation and a person's eyes are scanning this. They're going to see this and be confused of 0.1 or maybe this is a five. And even if that's just a fraction of a second, that's a fraction of a second that audience is not listening to you and you're losing the audience and it just looks a little bit sloppy. We want to keep a consistent number of significant digits here with the exception we're not going to put 0.0, .0 here. We'll just keep zero as perfectly zero. Let's fix that. Okay, same plot, but now we have a 1.0 and a negative 1. Point. Now that looks nice. Now a person's eyes can go right down that and they can see everything to the significance that, that makes sense. So we have this this one in line with the zero, this zero in line with the five, that's all well and good. So is this fixed? Is this a diagram you would be proud of that you would paste into your homework or a publication? Answer still no, this is still not good enough. There's a lot wrong with this. Let's take the next few. I said we were plotting sine and cosine. Can you tell which is which? Well, you can probably look at the magnitude and, and sort of make a guess, but no, we can't. They're both solid blue lines. And so we don't know which is which. And if you weren't telling this person that you're plotting sine and cosine, they might not even know what that is. 
So we need to distinguish all of the entities on the plot. Okay. Well, let's do this with color. So we have a blue line and we have a red line. So we can tell the difference, right? Well, there's two problems. What if somebody prints that on a black and white printer and it comes out looking like this? Or maybe we have a colorblind person looking at this. They're not going to be able to tell the difference between the red and the blue line. So we don't want to do that. What's the fix to this? Here's a fix that I like. I love color, but it could be printed in black and white or a colorblind person could be looking at this. So sometimes I will change not only the color, but the line style at the same time. So now visually, yes, it's a different color, but also if it's printed in black and white, those two lines are printed with different styles so they can still be distinguished. And on top of that, we've added a legend which tells us which line is which. Okay, so looking at this color figure or even the black and white figure, I would ask, is this something that is a good graphic that you'd be proud of that you are ready to paste into your homework or a publication? Well, I've got you paranoid here and you're gonna say no. And actually it is no, there's still a bit wrong with this. Let's think about it. The legend is right over top of the data. That's not a good thing to do. Move the legend out of the way. We could do that two different ways. We could just move the legend out of the way. We could move the legend to outside or no legend at all. Maybe we just label them sine and cosine this way. Either way is fine. Okay, so now we have our fonts big enough, consistent number of significant digits. The axes are labeled. The lines are distinguished, color and black and white. We know which one's sine. We know which one's cosine. Whew, finally. Do we have a good plot? Is this something we'd be proud to paste into our homework or in a publication or a presentation? The answer is still no. There's still some things wrong with this. And here it's a formatting thing. When we enter equations, this is not a proper equation. Variables have to be italicized and nothing else is italicized. So here we would italicize F and X, but not the parentheses. Down here, we should italicize the theta. Also in the legend, italicizing theta. Let's go ahead and fix that. Okay, so now we have an italicized theta here. We should not italicize COS and SIN. If we italicized the cosine, the COS, I would be asking you, what is variable C? What is variable O? What is variable S? Because that's C times O times S. But as a function, we won't italicize it. The exception is F. When F itself is the function, we don't italicize that. Some people would argue that that shouldn't be italicized, but the parentheses definitely not, and the X definitely not. Uh, these thetas are italicized. Theta down here is italicized. The general rule is variables and parameters are always italicized. <clears throat> and nothing else is. One little exception to that, for whatever reason, I don't know why, upper uppercase Greek letters aren't italicized. I don't know why that is, but they're not italicized. Okay, is this a good graphic that you would be proud to paste into your homework or presentation or publication? I think that's pretty good. We could continue of, you know, maybe the font should be smaller or bigger or, or look at problems like that. But I think that's pretty good. And this is representative of what I would expect from you on your homeworks. And when you go through the checklist, it's going to take you through everything and more that we just went through. But it's very typical of what you look for in a diagram. One last thing. OK, so you created a great graphic. You saved it, you paste it into your document, and this can happen a lot of times. Suddenly, it becomes blurred and pixelated. This is bad. This was a good graphic, but it is no longer a good graphic. It is pixelated. So you must watch this. You must be very careful with pixelated graphics. And so really what you should do is get the figure into your final document in the final size and then go through the checklist of font sizes, line widths, pixelation, and all that. 
Here's another bad thing. And this is really common and this is really amateur. So somebody will create a plot of a sine and cosine and boom, they will make it full page. They'll devote an entire page to that figure to make that professor super happy. This is amateur time. This is horrible. This is a waste. All of your figures and diagrams should be as small as possible such that it is still easily read. And just by going full screen, you're making, you're wasting a lot of space. And if you want examples of this, look at some very high end journals like Nature. Uh, you don't ever see a big boom, full screen, just plot of sine and cosine. Normally they're, they're half margin wide things and the diagrams are very compact yet still easily read. So that's what I require of you. Make the figures as small as possible such that they're still easily read. And so typically your diagrams are the same width as your text. If you're putting diagrams in a dual column uh, journal, your figure will be the width of one column. Now, sometimes things are just complicated enough. They need to be bigger and that's also fine. So this is much better. It's small and probably the appropriate size. It really would not need to be any larger than this. And it's always a bit of a judgment call. I think the important thing is that you're thinking about it. Now, just if you're curious, here's the final MATLAB code that I use to generate this. I'm not gonna go through this code now. There's MATLAB sessions after this, which will step you through everything that's happening here. That'll show you how to dress up and format your graphics. On to 2D graphics, because there's some new concepts that come up here, but a lot of the old ones still apply. Let's get into this. So what are good 2D graphics? So here we have some kind of function and then some kind of line plotted on top of that. Is this a good graphic? And would you be proud to copy and paste that into your homework, presentation, or publication? And well, if you're following with the pattern, no, this is horrible. There's a lot wrong with it. Let's look at a few. First of all, the color scale. Uh, I see black and I see black. Are these really corresponding to two colors or is this maybe a color sort of map in the background that's been printed black and white and maybe this is a dark blue and this is a dark red and one's negative numbers and positive numbers? Uh, that could be. So, and the other thing is, even if this was properly colored, I don't know what black corresponds to. Is this zero and white 100? So how do I know any of that? So there's a few things we can do. We can, you can do your homework or publications in color. Uh, I like color a lot, but something like this that has the default MATLAB uh, jet color map, which by the way, is no longer the default. The newer versions of MATLAB, I believe are using a color map called Perula. Uh, but the old jet was bad because if you printed this in black and white, yeah, you couldn't distinguish the dark red from the dark blue. So, I prefer grayscale because that will print well in gray. It maybe looks a little bit boring when you when you could do color, but it works. Another thing you can use is specialized color maps. And the new Perula, the new default in MATLAB does this where it's not only color, but if printed in grayscale also still looks good and you can interpret everything. Okay, so we fixed that. Are these figures that you would be proud to place in your homework presentation or publication? Well, no, there's still a lot wrong with this. Let's look at the next few things. There's no color bar provided. What number does blue correspond to? What number does red correspond to? The other thing is this line. This is a black line. Notice when it passes through the black region, we lose it. How do we know this black line doesn't do a loop or something here? We don't know. And we lose it in the dark blue. Uh, we don't quite lose it in the dark red, but you know what? We could if this red became dark enough and we're certainly losing it here. So the line's not always visible. Also, our axes aren't labeled. Is this space or you know what, what, what does this represent? So we need to label everything. Okay, we added our color bar. So now we can tell the difference. We can say, all right, dark red, oh, that's like a 0.9, a green, that's a, 
a 0.55 or so. Is that fixed with our color bar? No, still got a lot wrong. Still no axis labeling. We seem to forget to have done that. Uh, one from our 1D graphics that we should recognize is that these fonts are way too small. We can't necessarily read them. If you're on a big enough monitor, you know what? Maybe they're probably big enough, but these are likely too small. And I, I think this line is too thin. If this graphic were pasted and then reduced down, we could lose that line. So let's fix that. Okay, we have labeled our axes. We have made the fonts bigger. We have made this line thicker. Is this a figure that you would be proud to paste into your homework, presentation, or publication? Well, of course not, because this is what we're going through. And there's still a lot wrong with this. We still haven't really fixed the dark background. We made the lines thicker, so you notice it's a little bit easier to interpret, but we lose it here. And if this were printed in black and white, we would definitely lose it here and probably lose it out here. So we need to fix that. On the color bar, inconsistent number of digits. They really should have a 1.0 here because it's gonna take somebody's eyes just that extra half second to realize that the, the order of magnitude of the numbers here is, is offset. And notice, Y and X, they're actually variables. Those should be italicized. Axis should not, but X and Y should be italicized. So we have to worry about the formatting. Now here's a trick that I like to use to put a line against a busy background. Because if you have a background that has darks and brights, and let's say you use a black line, you'll lose it in the dark background and you'll if you have a white line, you'll lose it in the light background. So here's what I like to do. I like to give a, uh, a dark line and then give it kind of this white border or white glow. Now we might think, how on earth do we do that in MATLAB? And there is actually no option to make a glow around lines. So what I do is I just plot it twice. I first plot a thick white line and then I plot a thin black line. So it's just, I copy and paste the, whatever I'm using to plot, probably the line command in MATLAB, I just copy and paste it. I do it twice, once with a thick white and next with a thinner black. Okay, we've also fixed the italicized on, on X and Y, and we fixed our number of significant digits. So now I'll ask, is this a good figure that you would be proud to put in a presentation, your homework, or a publication? I think this is pretty good. You know, we could always continue to pick on this forever. I might say, you know, maybe I want a little bit of border between this line and the edge. Uh, maybe instead of labeling it X axis, maybe I give it units. I mean, we could go on forever picking on this, but I think that's pretty good. Concluding remarks. Give some thought to horizontal uh, versus vertical. And I'd be cautious using vertical. I think horizontal is always preferred. And I would try to always design your diagrams to be in the horizontal format. And vertical is an option, but it always has a special case. It's when you really need to go full screen. You need that horizontal space of a vertical thing. And you'll see a lot of this when somebody's making a giant table with a lot of data in it or something like that. But just to make it vertical because you want it to be vertical is not a good reason and stick with horizontal whenever possible. We'll end this just from general advice for diagrams. I mentioned somewhere in here that there's a graphics checklist and these are some of the key points off of that checklist, although that checklist has more. So remember the first thing, diagrams should always be as small as possible so that they're still easily read. Bigger is not better, bigger is worse. You're wasting space. You always wanna make sure your diagram's clear. It's easy to read, it's easy to interpret. You want to label everything. You want somebody with just the figure to understand everything about it and be able to interpret it. You wanna look at all your fonts and lines. You wanna make sure that they're all big enough to see, yet not awkwardly big, and this is, there's somewhat of an artist touch here, but line thicknesses from like 0.5 to four is the general range you should stay in in terms of number of points. Font sizes, 
you know, 10 to 14, maybe 8 to 14 in that range. I definitely wouldn't go smaller or bigger unless you have a special purpose in doing that. You do want a comfortable amount of white space surrounding all of the entities in your plot, but you don't want that to become awkward and start wasting space or scaling your data incorrectly. And you saw that. We had the sine and cosine. We put a little bit of extra space above and below it. And we want this sort of comfortable amount of space about everything. So people that do house decor, they call that feng shui. And so there's there's feng shui in your in your graphics as well. Now, good diagrams take a lot of work to produce. When I write papers and proposals, I spend at least half my time doing nothing other than graphics. So keep that in mind of how important the graphics are. Um, the graphics can make or break your, your paper, your presentation, your proposal. When you paste diagrams into a text document, that diagram absolutely must stay within the margins of the text. If you have one inch margins, don't let that graphic go out into the margins. That's another amateur mistake, don't do that. Your diagram should not be pixelated. And even if it starts off its life not pixelated, very often you can paste it into a document and maybe you shrink it down, you save the document, you close it, you load it back up, and you realize, no, I wanted that bigger. Now when you stretch it bigger, when you shrunk it down, some programs will realize, oh, okay, this we don't need all the resolutions since we've shrunk this figure down. It gets rid of that extra data. And then when you go ahead and increase the size, it becomes pixelated. And you've really got to watch that and make sure your graphics does not become pixelated. So always, always pay attention to your graphics. Make sure they're high quality. Make sure they're publication ready. Another whole reason for this, if you just do a quick job of generating something because you're busy and, and you generate this data and you just want to get it out and show people and you can come back later or whatever, you know, it might be a year later and you don't know what you did to create that data. And all of a sudden you have to spend maybe two weeks of your life. You're extending, you're delaying your graduation of your degree for two weeks because you have to redo that graphic in order to make a, a better one. Make the good graphic right off. Now, at first, this will be a lot of work for you, but with practice, you can generate excellent graphics with very little more work than it would take to just generate the sloppy graphics. So practice it now, generate those skills, and it will serve you very well in your career. From the bottom of my heart, thank you very much for watching this video. I love hearing your stories about how these videos helped you. I also love answering your questions. So please tell me your stories and ask your questions in the comment section. I promise I will try to answer every single question that's asked. If you like this video, hit the like and subscribe button. I also recommend visiting the official course website that has links to the latest versions of the notes, the latest videos, and there's lots of other resources to help you learn, including implementations in MATLAB. I'll see you in the next video.